Good morning. Everyone hear me? Yes, yes. yes. good. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Inora Nation uh, on whose land we gather today. I um, also want to thank Nicole um, and all the team here for um, hosting me and inviting me. Um, and I am going to say this genuinely, I'm, I'm humbled that so many people showed up. Um, I wasn't expecting this, so thank you for coming out this morning. I hope it's going to be worth your while. I'll do my best. Um, hmm. Can you read that? We build brands. Hands up if you've heard a design studio, an advertising agency, or a marketing company say this. Oh, right, quite a few. Yeah. It's frustrating, isn't it? It's really annoying because it's not true. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about truth, right? Uh, it's not true, and also um, it's misleading to the business world and business owners. I do understand, while well, designers and marketing people will say this, it's kind of a strategic thing and a business thing, but I think it's damaging to what we do as, a, as, a, as an industry. Um, and I'm going to explain why. Anyone recognize this logo? One in the back, one in the middle. Okay, it's Chase Manhattan Bank. Okay, big banking firm in, in the US. Anyone know what this means, what it stands for, what, what kind of the rationale was? One, okay. An aperture, okay. <clears throat> so, the designers who did this, uh, Shermai and Geismar in, 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 uh, in America, one of the big branding firms in America, um, the designer who did this said this. Now, you don't have to read this. I'll read it for you because it's important, okay? When Chase, ba when Chase National Bank merged with the Bank of Manhattan Company to create Chase Manhattan Bank, the new company became the second largest in the United States. The new organization needed a new graphic identity to represent it effectively. Banks at the time generally used trademarks that grew from their initials or an image of the bank's headquarters buildings. Chase Manhattan briefly used an awkward combination, get wait, wait for this, of a map of the United States, a representation of the globe, the name of the bank, and the phrase worldwide banking, and the kitchen sink. <laughs> we became convinced that the bank would benefit from a simple symbol that could not only unite the new, two newly merged corporate cultures, but also come to stand in for the company's long, unwieldy name in the public mind. However, there is no symbol that really means banking, and no symbol that represented Chase. We turned to the idea of using an abstract symbol since we knew that Chase Manhattan had tremendous advertising resources that could quickly establish the symbol in the public mind. The short version of that is it means nothing. <laughs> right? Now, what, when I talk about logos, when I talk about identities, um, the way I describe it, and this is a fantastic example, is that they are a canvas for meaning. Now, there might be a rationale to start with, but that meaning will shift and change long after the designers designed the logo. Ergo, you can't design the brand. All right, we'll get into this further. Closer to home, anyone recognize this? Oh, just turning up the volume. So we have one on the back, anyone recognize this? A few more, yes, a bit closer to home. Um, Canterbury, all right, so from New Zealand. Anyone know the history of this, what, what it's about, where it came from, anything, no? Okay, in 1904, three English guys came to New Zealand. They uh, set up a company in Canterbury in the South Island and loved it so much, they called their company the Canterbury Clothing Company. Um, and they started out by designing and producing uniforms for the uh, Australian and the New Zealand Army for w World War I. Now, we might know them because of the All Blacks and sport. And that's because they moved into the sporting world. And their tagline now is committed to the game. Um, they dropped the, 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 the clothing company, uh, the Canterbury Clothing Company, and now it's called Canterbury. But the symbol, um, three Cs for Cl Canterbury Clothing Company. I didn't even see the Cs originally. They've got a, uh, a, a silhouette of a Kiwi bird, because it's New Zealand, right? But that isn't an international recognized bird. So here we have um, three Cs for the company name, uh, the bird in there as the, as the part of the C for New Zealand location, and it also was supposed to represent the three founders. 
anything in that, say, World War I uniforms and sport? Do you think the people who designed this thought that that company was going to be in sport? Uh, you know, a hundred years later? Here's another one. Anyone know who this company is? I'll give you a prize if you can say the name of the company. <laughs> Do you know the history of this? In 1994, James uh, Jabaya set up a skateboard company in Lower Manhattan. It was a failing skateboard company. They decided to do some t-shirts for some extra cash, which is crazy because a couple of years ago, this brand, now this Supreme, was valued at two billion. So it's funny to think in 1994, they were struggling for cash, so they did some t-shirts. And that's just the history of the company. The logo, anyone know what that kind of means or what it's trying to represent? Okay. It's an appropriation of um, a famous pop artist called Barbara Kruger in America. And her work focuses on topics of culture, power, identity, consumerism, and sexuality. Fantastic for skateboarding, skate culture, fashion, but I'm probably, I'd wager that most of their customers for the last 30 years would have no idea. It wouldn't really mean anything to them. Because as I said, the logo is a canvas for meaning for all of us as customers, consumers, and society, and what we see the company does, and what we att attribute the meaning to that company. Not the designer who designed the logo and might be saying, we build brands. So there's a myth that we're busting here. <clears throat> now, I've been quite passionately saying designers don't build brands, but there are a few exceptions, and here they are. First, when you're a long-term strategic partner, so that is not when you're pulled in for a three-month exercise or a six-month exercise. When you're in long-term, influencing strategy, planning, product development, processes and systems, HR, recruitment, research and development, customer services, communications, and decisions in an ongoing manner while regularly engaging with the executive and the board, etc. Much deeper over a long period of time, and that's when a designer is able, or a studio is able to help build a brand. Another, when they're the founder or the owner. So they're working in the business on a daily basis, they're developing and helping to deliver the service or the customer offer, and they're using their design skills to do so. So they happen to be a designer, but they're running the business. Um, it's a long-term whole of organization effort, not a short-term external engagement, which is generally what design studios are engaged to do. The third, when you're working in-house and you're in a position to contribute or challenge to shape the company as it grows and evolves, and this depends on the designer's seniority, because you, know, you need to be senior in a, in, a, in, a, in a company to have that seat at the table, and whether you have influence on how business operates and how much the executive and board values design. Sounds lovely. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. Not all businesses are design-led, and this often dilutes the designer's input, excluding them from critical decisions. So they're kind of the three exceptions for people in the design field, the branding space, who can actually help build brands. And I say help, not just build brands. I apologize to anyone who's been out there saying, we build brands, and I'm just being rude. I, I apologize. But this is the truth. The logo doesn't make the brand, the brand gives the logo its value over time and when meaning is attributed to it and when products and services and experiences add up to something valuable. And then we look at a logo and go, oh yeah, that's what that means for me. And you're not having a conversation with the designer who did it. Now, there's a lot of definitions that fly around in our space and in the business world um, and I made an attempt to sort of make it a bit simpler, I would hope. And I start with the difference between what a brand is and what branding is. So I think a brand is who, you, well, not just me, it's, it's a common kind of view, but a brand is who you are, how you're perceived, and how people feel about your business. It's the core value of your business offer and a promise to your customers of the value they should expect. It is the sum of all the experiences someone has with your business. It's what you live and deliver every day. It cannot be manufactured, created, or invented by an external consultant. Why? because then you'll be required to live up to someone else's vision rather than your own. That's, that's brand. Now, I was challenged recently by a friend of mine, Chris Doe, uh, in, in LA. He's got a great podcast and YouTube channel called The Future. And he said, but isn't that business as well? Isn't that what you could describe businesses? And I would sort of say, some, 
businesses, but not everyone. And most of the businesses wouldn't be doing this. They'd just be rocking up, doing what they do and hoping to get paid. Um, but even still, if we were to use this definition for all businesses, they just can't decide they're a brand because the people who decide whether you're a business or a brand is, is all of us. Now, I'm not saying all the designers, I'm saying the customers and the clients and society. When we all collectively say, that's a brand, then you become a brand. Not when a designer says, yeah, you're a brand, or a business owner goes, yeah, we're a brand. That's not how it works. So what's branding? It's how you articulate and appropriately communicate your business to customers and to the world across a variety of channels. This is where designers are useful. There's other definitions that are flying around in the business space, and one of them is uh, purpose, being purpose-led, which is awesome, right? Um, but I ask businesses that I work with, what is the purpose of the business? And most of the time they say, to make money. I go, uh -huh. So okay, if, let's take that. Um, money is a function of business. It's an outcome, it's an objective. And there is a shift at the moment in the world but where people are saying actually money in the business space are saying money isn't everything and the purpose and all that, but it gets greenwashed. Oh, we've got purpose, yeah, but we're making money. Um, let's talk about our purpose because we're making money. Um, now, that's not to say that money is, is wrong. That's not to say that. What's happening is it's flipping. Now, traditionally, businesses are about money. They make money, out, you know. Product services, money, thank you, revenue. Um, it's flipping to us now. We have the power with money. And it's been articulated probably the best by a lady called Annie Lepe in, uh, in, in, in America. She's an author and an educator. And she said this, it's going to be wild if you're not thinking this way. Every time you spend money, you're casting a vote for the type of world you want to live in. The power shifted. The power is in our pockets. And we decide what businesses and brands are worth supporting. And we decide, with the money that we have, what those businesses are contributing to the world. And our part in that transaction is literally, we're giving them our time, our money, or whatever it might be. And that might sound all kind of all cozy and hippie and you know, academic in theory, because as an author and an educator in America, Let's go to the big end of town. Anyone know of a gentleman called Larry Fink? Yeah. Yep. Anyone know of BlackRock? Yeah. Yep. So this is what the chairman and CEO of BlackRock um, said, and I'll explain BlackRock for the rest of the audience in a minute. Without a sense of purpose, no company, either public or private, can achieve its full potential. It will ultimately lose the license to operate from key stakeholders. BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world with 10 trillion in assets under management since January of last year. 10 trillion. So we're looking at the two ends of the spectrum here. We've got an author and an educator saying every time you spend money, that's, you know, you've got a say and a vote in how the world operates. And then the big end of town, you've got this guy and people like him saying, everything's changing. He put all of the businesses in their portfolio on notice, all the CEOs on notice that if they're not thinking this way, they'll reconsider whether they're in their portfolio. How's that for a, uh, a wake-up call for the companies going, we make money? I made an attempt to, to sort of put a definition around what being purpose-driven means, because it's so vague. And my view is that being purpose-driven means putting something incredibly important, something that has a wider, bigger impact in the world, above and before making a profit. That's not to say you can't make a profit. It just means that you will put your purpose before making a profit. If you were cornered to say, if we do this, we lose money, but we stand for our beliefs, that's your purpose. It's your kind of benchmark, it's your filter. If we feel like we will continue with our purpose and we're okay to lose money on this because it's important to us, that's your purpose. For about 15 years, um, the last 15 years, I've been having some very, very um, intense conversations with businesses and business owners. Um, and I've been finding some patterns in the conversations I've had with them around some of these topics and themes. And I decided to sort of say, well, well how could I maybe articulate to the business owners 
what it means to be a brand. So I came up with 15 brand principles. Um, I'm going to share six of them with you this morning. Um, and the reason why I want to do that was to say, if I can help business owners understand what it is we all do as in the creative field and have a common language or a common understanding, then I think we're all going to win. Now, that was the kind of plan, and that was the plan for me just to have a conversation with these uh, business owners. Um, and it, it's, it's had a lot of traction. It's, it's made it easy for them to understand what it is we do. Um, but before I start, um, do a little exercise. I want you to think of a brand, one that you know very well, you understand its product or its service, its value to the world or whatever it might be, but you are not a customer and you are never likely to be one. So you might say, um, I would never go to McDonald's, for example, or I, I'm Apple, no way would I go to IBM or Dell or I'm whatever. You know, so if you can think of one, but one that you understand, a brand that you understand, go on. A brand is the most valuable real estate in the world, a corner of someone's mind and a relevant place in their life. So you know of a brand quite well, what they stand for, what their value might be, and you're not even a customer and you're not going to be one. And yet, in today's busy, 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 complicated world, you've given them a space in your mind. You've given them a corner in your mind to know and understand them. Now, why would you do that? You would do that because they're either a benchmark in the industry or they're a reference for other businesses that you do support. Or they might be the antithesis of, of your values and you go, when I think of evil, I think of them. Right? So there's some relevance while you have it in your head. Um, now, I can't even take credit for three quarters of that sentence. So you might think, you know, Kevin's trying to be all fancy and this is what he's saying. The first part of this, a brand is the most valuable real estate in the world, the corner of someone's mind, was said by Sir John Hegarty, who's a guru in the advertising world in, uh, in the UK. Uh, if you don't know him, check him out. He's got some incredible books. But he said that, and all I did was add on the, the relevance in our life. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Number three, I'm going to share six. This is the, the number three in the, in the 15. A brand is, inter is internal before it's external. Your staff need to be your greatest ambassadors. The mistake is to think that branding is purely about external broadcasting. This happens all the time. When I'm talking to businesses, they start talking about marketing, outside, comms, websites, communication, who you're talking to. And what they miss is that if you're building your brand, everyone in the business needs to be aligned. Everyone needs to understand what the hell we're doing and what we believe in. Because if we don't, and we go out into the world and we broadcast it, there's a complete disconnect. The company is saying this and the people charged with delivering it are on a totally different page. A brand is not a department, it's the responsibility and the representation of your entire organization from receptionist to CEO. I get this all the time, you're working with businesses and they say, oh, that's the marketing department or here's the marketing director and talk to the marketing team. So if we're thinking about a brand and it's limited to the marketing department, what does that say about the CEO? What does that say about the rest of the organization who have been excluded from the conversation around building the brand that they work for. This is always, I get a giggle with this one. Mission, vision, and value statements are a great internal guide, but no one outside the organization really cares. They will only be interested in the value that these statements deliver. Now I can prove that. Think of your favorite brand, the one that you might love most, or interact with most. Can you think or remember their mission statement, or their vision statement, or their values. Do you care? No. What you do care about is how do those statements and those commitments show up in how I interact with them, in their products, their services, customer experience. You will get a sense of what they stand for from how you interact with them, but you don't need to be able to remember those things, but they're very important to keep everyone aligned in the business. If you know these things, you know where you're heading, you know who you're part of, you know the community and the culture you're part of, and you're happy to deliver on that. All the rest of us don't care. A brand is a long-term and evolving objective. It requires dedication and commitment. Building and maintaining your brand cannot be outsourced. It is not a short-term exercise. Chase Manhattan Bank, Canterbury, Supreme. Decades 
and decades. <clears throat> this is something that people try and struggle with, I think, of business owners. Not every business is a brand. In fact, most aren't, and that's okay. You either go and say that they are, but you don't have to be, and you're probably not. But you can have a brand mindset. You can have the thinking and the mentality and the approach that brands have that are successful, and you can use it in your business or work with businesses to help them get there. And as we said earlier, we don't get to decide if they're a brand as, as a designer or a consultant. They don't get to decide if they're a brand as the business owners. It's all of us who do as, as society. So if you've got a brand mindset and you've got the approach to building a brand, then leave it up to everybody else to decide whether you're a business or a brand. And that's okay. The point is that designers and consultants are the assist. In this long-term evolving objective of building a brand, designers are the people who help at a certain point in time, uh, maybe through different points in time, but only at a point in time, not building the brand from designing logos. Now, I also wanted to look at the future. I wanted to see if, if, if I'm here sort of saying, hey, this is what brands are about, and this is what we should be thinking about, and I'm you know, smart, and you know, this is important. And I wanted to challenge myself and say, well, where's this all heading? Where are we going? not just in the brand space and the branding space, but it's society. Um, and I got a really, really good example from um, Edward de Bono. Anyone know Edward de Bono? So Edward de Bono, he created the phrase lateral thinking. Um, he, anyways, so he, look him up, he's amazing. Um, but I, I kind of realized that when I look at the future, it comes down to one word, and that one word is impact. Um, and Edward gave me this great example in one of his books, he didn't give it to me, but I read it in his book. So think of a factory on the side of a river, and traditionally what happens is the water comes downstream and they pull the clean water in and they do all the stuff and they push out polluted water. Down the stream, not caring about the health of the river, not caring about the health of the community that relies on the river, not caring about who's downriver, because they've got what they want. It's a familiar story. So Edward said, hmm, how about we just make one small change? that's incredibly simple and immensely complex. How about we take in clean water downstream and we push out our wastewater upstream, which means we're always going to be pulling in our wastewater. That means we need clean water. We need to put out clean water as waste because we're drawing it back in again. That just says swap inputs and outputs. It says swap your mentality. But that's really, really complicated, really difficult to do. What it will do as, as a sort of a result, the impact on the river and the community and the environment is fantastic. They're not pushing out waste, polluted water. They're pushing out clean water because they're drawing it back in again. Again, you might go, that's nice, that's academic. But really? De Bono's downstream pollution example later became law in some countries. That is the idea that's so the power of an idea. That is the power of impact. My view is that purpose is motivational, whereas impact is measurable. Now purpose, everyone talks about it, wonderful. But if you just got purpose as a bunch of words on a poster in the boardroom, it doesn't really go anywhere. You need to be able to measure it, and how you measure it is the impact that it makes. But if you have an, an impact model that doesn't have any purpose, it's just scattershot. So the relationship between purpose and impact is vital. Because one motivates you, the other one you measure. In 2015, at a, uh, in a Cone Communications Millennial CS, CS or study, 91% of millennials they talked about said they would switch brands to one associated with a cause and more likely to purchase a product with a social or environmental benefit and volunteer for a cause supported by a company they trust. That was in 2015. Now we can kind of laugh at millennials and they get ridiculed a lot and they're like all utopian and stuff, but there's millennials in this room, there's millennials in businesses that are being working in companies. So now you've got a, a talent, a, sorry, a, a talent, a, sorry, a war for talent. How do you get the people who want this into your company because they're going to choose somewhere else? And you also have millennials who are leading businesses, 
and they're thinking like this. And you've got them who run businesses and they're thinking like this. This is where things are heading. Now let's go broader. In 2018, there was a Harvard Business Review uh, uh, research and um, nine out of 10 people, they talked to, I think it was like 38,000 people, nine out of 10 people were willing to trade a percentage of their lifetime earnings for grading meaning at work. Across age and salary groups, workers want meaningful work badly enough they're willing to pay for it. So they, they kind of went, well, how much would you pay? And it turns out that they were willing to forfeit a 20% pay rise over their career for meaningful work, which led the research to say, we need an update on the essentials in the 21st century, food, shelter, clothing, and meaningful work. And why they say that is, in America, most people use 21% of their income for accommodation or rent or mortgage, and they're willing to forfeit 20% for meaningful work. This isn't millennials, this is across age, across sector. How's this working out in, in, in the real world, in, in big businesses and brands who we know? I'll skip through a few of these here. Lego. Lego is trying to refashion the product it is best known for. It wants to eliminate its dependence on petroleum-based plastics and build its toys entirely from plant-based or recycled materials by 2030. They're not jumping up and down talking about this, they're just doing it. They're going to do that without changing the color of the, of the bricks or the smooth click of the bricks. They're just going to do it because it's the right thing to do. And if you think of the gargantuan impact Lego has using petrol, and then when they shift to this, that gargantuan impact is going to be positive. It's going to be amazing. And they're just doing it because it's the right thing to do. But also because all of the signals are telling them this is what's now expected. McDonald's. According to McDonald's, their new purpose will mean more support for farming communities and aim to source 100% of packaging from renewable, recycled or certified sources by 2025 donating millions of pounds in weight of food from the supply chain and restaurants to people in need and reducing barriers to employment for more than 2 million people worldwide. It's a massive organization, whether we like them or we don't like them, it's huge. And they're doing this. Impact's going to be incredible. In the UK, Aldi. Aldi's CEO, Giles Hurley, sent a letter to suppliers informing them that the supermarket chains pledge for own brand packaging to be 100% recyclable, reusable and compostable by last year um, and warning them that all other products will need to meet the standard by 2025. Significantly, Hurley was blunt about the fact Aldi's request was non-negotiable. This isn't a, do you want to opt in? It's non-negotiable. And the future decisions will be based on our supply partner's ability to lead and adapt in this area. So we have businesses who are saying, oh, we should have a purpose, right? Because it's cool on a poster. And we've got businesses saying, it's the right thing to do, we should do it. So they're on the right track. The businesses on the other track are saying, ah, yeah, we should do it because we're supposed to do it. Now it's a matter of survival. Because if they don't, we know customers aren't going to go near them if there's options. We know that businesses aren't going to engage with them because they're looking for something else. They're looking for a more positive impact in the world. All of the signals, all of the movement is heading in this direction. There's a company, a small startup in, in Melbourne um, called Great Wrap. And it's, the, it's a plastic-free, plant-based alternative to kitchen brands like Glad Wrap. And they've designed their product in such a way that their impact is already built in. Once used, the wrap can go straight into your home compost system or green waste bin, where it breaks down quicker than orange peel. Designing impact into the product or service from the get-go. Impact model. Banking, who would have thought? In 2020, the European Central Bank said that it will start conducting in-depth assessments of how bank balance sheets account for climate risks from last year onwards. Who would have thought? Investors, firms with greater negative impact generate less investor interest, which reduces their stock market valuation and raises their cost of capital. These are money people. And they're saying this. Investors. Um, a group of the largest international investors wrote a letter to 36 of the biggest brands in Europe. And this is an excerpt. It would not be consistent to emphasize climate risks in the strategic report, but not consider these same risks in the account, the letter said. If accounts leave out material climate risks, too much capital will go towards activities that put shareholder capital at risk. Worse still, this puts all our futures at risk. 
investors, money, the big end of town. Countries, we're looking at this in countries. So not just companies and individuals, countries are doing this. From June to August of last year, Germany made unlimited travel on trains just nine euro per month, saving 1.8 million tonnes of CO2 emissions. It's equivalent to what 350,000 homes produce in a year. Urban air pollution dropped by 7%. The programme was devised to reduce the impact of inflation on German citizens and cost 231 million euro, which was funded by a windfall tax on energy companies. Spain is following suit, offering free travel. So when we start talking about impact, what does that mean? So impact, the impact model that we're talking about here is Germany said we want to reduce the impact of inflation on German citizens. That's the focus. How does that ripple out? 1.8 million tons of CO emissions drops. Um, air pollution drops by 7%. So the ripple out effect of that impact, which starts about how to reduce inflation in a smart way with a positive impact, has a flow on effect that changes countries, changes the lives of citizens, and then becomes a leader for others to follow suit. This is the impact I'm talking about. Now, as we talked about, traditional businesses have this sort of revenue model thing that they're, you know, make money, do good stuff, make money, make more of it as much as possible, as fast as possible. Um, I think that it needs to be an impact model. And why I mean that is that if we put impact at the center, impact equals relevance equals return. So if you have an impact model that is relevant in the lives of people, they will transact with you whether that is revenue, time, reputation, whatever. They'll give you a return. The more return you get and you reinvest back into your impact, the more relevant you become and the more people will transact with you more regularly. And then around it goes. What that says is money and revenue is the outcome. It's the objective. But at the center is an impact model. We have lots of companies and organizations going out there saying, hey, we do this great stuff and we, we're like purpose driven and we're, we're amazing and we've got a thousand years of experience and me, 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 all about us. The truth, no one cares about your well-crafted story. And businesses say, what? Well, how are we gonna tell our story? Well, here's the truth. They only care about where your story shows up in their story. So we need to talk about how relevant we are in the lives of the people that we're engaging with, our customers, our clients. If we can say we understand your world and here's where we show up, here's where we're relevant, they will listen. If it's all about pick me, I'm better than them, join the queue. No one's listening. No one cares. I believe ROI in the 21st century will evolve to become return on impact rather than return on investment. Uh, I've got to wrap it up in a few minutes, so I'm going to finish with a very quick um, personal story. Um, in 2013, um, um, we lost my mum to cancer. Um, and I remember being with her and thinking, this is, this is life-changing for me. Uh, and shortly after, we lost my dad to cancer. He was, he was 70, but my mum was 64. She had plans for the future. And, you know, we don't know how much time we have. So I realized there and then, we don't have time to fuck around. We don't have time to say, let's just get another job or another project and just, you know, get another portfolio. If we want to have a meaningful life doing meaningful things, we don't have time to fuck around. We don't. Okay? We just got to do what we want to do, what's meaningful to us, and add value and impact in the world. Now, all of this stuff I've talked about today, and, and, and this in particular, this, this story, led me to um, write a book, which might sound egotistical or arrogant or presumptuous, but I was having this conversation so many times with so many people, I felt I need to document it so that it can be shared. And it's not just me talking, it's, it can be shared out. And if it means that people get value from it, great. But if it means that they hate it and think it's rubbish, great then it's a reference point for them. They can build on it, they can argue against it. 
But I did this because I said to myself, I don't have time to fuck around. And I did it because I've got an 11 and a half year old son and I said, the world's moving in this space into the impact space. And I'm gonna write this for him and his generation and this wonderful little baby over here because it's their future that we're talking about. And we, as designers and creatives, we have a role in this conversation with businesses where we can make a micro conversation around logos into a macro conversation about impact. It can expand our value to them. It can expand how we can offer our services in a broader way to them. And quite frankly, it's our responsibility to go and hold businesses to account because we are the custodians of the messages that we do on their behalf. We've got to push back and tell them there's a better way. Because every day we're designing our future and history is watching. Thank you. Yes. Shoot. Sorry. Uh, uh, so going back to branding and having everyone on the same page um, from secretary to CEO, one of the things that I've seen and struggled with is getting everyone on the same page is how do you get everyone to care other than having the miracle of a leader who is willing to yep. make that a priority. Not everyone does that yep. because they're not, they don't maybe have that background to see the importance or maybe they didn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, start at the bottom and work their way up to the top so they understand all the different levels. Yep. So any, any yep. thoughts on that? Yep. There's, uh, it's a really good question and there's, there's two ways that we normally look at how do we get people aligned internally and one way is top down. We've got leadership that's clear and smart and they are very, very passionate about this is what we believe in. Uh, one of the other um, principles is that your brand is your filter. So you can be very clear to your team and say, this is what we stand for clearly. And people in the business can go, oh shit, I didn't know you. that's what you did. That doesn't fit with me. And they can opt out themselves. So what you have left is everyone's on the same page purely because of clarity lets people decide whether they're on the bus or not. Um, and then with that, you need consistency. So you're clear and you consistently do it and you, you, you live what you say. That's one way, top down. Now, what if you have leaders that aren't like that? Why are you stuck? You gotta go find a company. I don't know if you saw, but in the last couple of uh, weeks, Starbucks is having a bit of an issue. They've got their original CEO back on, I can't remember his name, um, because staff are unionizing. What does that mean? They're having a voice. They're standing up for themselves. And the leadership is struggling with this idea that, holy shit, these guys want to have a voice. Right? And I'm not advocating one way or the other about unionism, but what I'm saying is that staff can come up and have a voice. We know from Google to other big tech companies that staff have done walkouts. They've done protests on certain things. Um, so there is a way to mobilize internally. And while the pendulum is still kind of heading over into this impact space and, and that it is happening and companies are very quickly going to realize that those who haven't already, we're going to lose people. We're going to lose good people if we're not going to listen or be clear to get a culture that supports what we're trying to do. Um, and that essentially is called internal communications. It's not, not a new thing, but it's a new approach. How are you clear and decisive and you know, open to listen to your, your, your team and say, what, are, what do we think we are? And then define it, articulate it, live by it. And they can decide whether they're in or out. Got a question down here? Oops, got a question here. Thanks, Kevin. Amazing. I'm a startup founder and working uh, with informal waste pickers in Jakarta, oh, Indonesia. Amazing. Uh, up, upskilling informal waste workers to make products from, um, from waste intercepted from landfill. Um, my question is, uh, well, from the beginning, we're very small. We're, we're a brand uh, that is we're building, um, but looking at partnering with. Uh, corporations and, and other businesses um, who are aligned. So any of your, your thoughts? Yep. 
First of all, congratulations, amazing work. Um, I think that that is very much where things are moving. Um, and you can say you're a small organization, but that doesn't matter, right? Because you're part of a wave of, of organizations. Now, um, maybe your question is, how do we get those partners on board? Right. And, and I have this view, <laughs> I'm working with some, some good friends of mine at the moment, where they were putting together an investor deck, right? a pitch deck, because we're going to go out and try and get money from investors. Come. And I was like, yeah, 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 I've, I've got some views on this, guys. And they're like, oh, what? So can you change one word? Just, 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 just one word. And can you change in investor pitch to investor invitation? Because what we want to do is say, we are doing this. Whether you're in or out, doesn't matter. We're going to keep going. So do you want to come with us? Do you want to come change the world with us? Because we're inviting like-minded investors to come on the journey with us. Which is different to, I'm desperate, hand out, can I have your money? And you, that's got nothing to do with values or, or any kind of alignment. That's just, I need the cash. When you flip it, that changes how you talk. It changes how you go into a meeting. That one word, invitation. Because whether they support you or not, you'll find a way to keep going. So we're making change. Do you want to come? Does that help? Ten o'clock. We've got one. Do we have time for me? Um, okay, one more we've got question, more questions. We've uh, got three. One question, questions. and then if people do, just to respect your time, if anyone does want to sneak out, it is ten, so feel free. Um, but otherwise, if you want to stay, and we'll just rip a little bit longer, and then we'll um, Kevin will stay around and um, and the books and stuff. But yeah, it's just exa um, exactly it's ten now. So if anyone actually for maybe, for anyone, you're not going to be judged. Free, if you want to leave, go. <laughs> Um, I thank you for, for being here, uh, totally, so please go. Um, any questions that we can get to on the floor, thank you so much. Any questions that we get on the floor, we'll do as many. Any we can't get to, I've got nowhere to go for the next couple of hours. So, yeah, so I, I can hang out, we can talk outside if you like. So, question down the middle, yes, maybe speak up a little bit. Well, yeah, we're talking about um, when I'm working with a business or organization, I'm talking about impact and they're, they're saying, yeah, we're about money. So how do I say, it's not about money, it's about impact. Um, how do I get around that is essentially the question, right? Uh, well, first of all, I don't say it's not about money. I say it is absolutely about money. It's about a different way of getting there. And that's the first step in how to talk to a business owner who goes, oh good, you're not a greeny socialist activist who's trying to tell me I'm evil. You're actually saying, we can actually still run a business. And I tell them, it is important for you to run a business that is profitable so that you can reinvest back into the impact that you make or should be making or we can talk about what kind of impact you can make. I literally tell them, impact equals relevance equals return and I explain that model and for any, please use it if it's, if it's of any use. I've had a really, really good response to that because it speaks to them as the, oh, actually, yeah, this is, this is about growth. This is about all the return they're looking for. It's just a different way of doing it. I also say in my first meetings with them, um, I'm only interested in working with meaningful, um, oh, sorry, good people doing meaningful things. Is that you? Now, most of them go, yeah, because they want to be right. And then you go, good, you're on record. So if you renege, I can go, what happened to the doing good things thing that you just said? Isn't that just bullshit? So I, I corner them into it. And then I tell them um, my little personal story. I talk about my mum and my dad and I say, I don't have time to fuck around. I use that language. And I use that language intentionally because it's abrasive. And they go, oh, shit, okay. And I say, I do not have time to fuck around. Are we going to do something good or not? Because I'm not in it for another job. I'm in it to move the needle. Can we do that together? And when you start talking about that, it changes the conversation, which then takes me to the next stage, which is, so you've, you've, you want to talk to me about logos and branding, okay. 
why are you doing that? Is there some big shift? Are you, are, do you have an impact model? Is there some big sort of change in the business that means you need to change the logo and the columns? Because if there isn't, well, one, I'm not interested, and two, save your money, please, business owner, because if you're going to go and do this with me, and then it's business as usual, it's no point. So what is the reason for what we're going to do? You will find if you do that, or at least I found, the conversation goes in a totally different direction, and you're not talking about the traditional graph design deliverables of branding that they've come to you for. And that's why I'm saying, guys, this puts more on the table for us. Not only in terms of products, services, or money, but in terms of how we can help impact. Because if we use the organizations that we work with to scale an impact, then we're part of that. We're the assist. They're doing the scaling of the impact. We're guiding them. So I see us as advisors, as those who challenge organizations and those who shepherd them into that space. And it's okay if they aren't going to change the world. You know? We're not all like you guys. Okay? And I think the, the, the trap is that we look at McDonald's and say, yeah, okay, that sounds good, you know, but not enough. Do more. I say our role is to cheer on organizations who can have a huge positive impact and say, that is amazing. We want you to do more. How can we help you do more? Because what they hear all the time is, not enough, not enough. And that's just going to go, oh, fuck. we can't win, so why bother? We need to be the motivators. We need to be the ones that are helping them. Does that answer your question? Um, I'm going to be led by Nicole to say that this conversation goes offline or carries on. Does anyone have like a really good question? A really bad <laughs> A real we got one last for now, and then we'll have more. Is it not yet? You got one? Tom here. Thanks so much for your time, uh, Mr. Finn. Oh, he actually I wrote, wrote it down. down. Yes. And it might be uncomfortable, that's okay. Please do. Space, yep, so please. <laughs> okay, so uh, you're a firm supporter of incorporating an ESC system. We know that already. It's a non negotiable in all fronts of the design and branding world. But is there any room for differing opinions? And can we include those who disagree, maybe by myself, to say climate change uh, you know, is not the most you know, huge uh, top priorities right now. Like, uh, we want to be incl an inclusive world, and I mm. totally respect that front. But yep. is it a little bit hypocritical if we're turning down people for differing opinions you know, in, in, in a change of world today? Good question. And I don't, I'm not insulted, or, uh, and I, but I think um, this is another trap that we all fall into, is when we talk about impact, we just think climate straight away. Impact is how are we going to impact on um, our, our staff's family? How are we going to impact their world, which when it ripples out into the community, they're able to give back to the community or they're able to um, sustain their life. So they go and they join the economy and they're paying their taxes and everything. So impact doesn't have to be huge. It can be bullying. It can be um, poverty. It can be whatever we, we want to, it to be. We just need to define what our impact is. Now, I'll give you an example. In, in America, there's a company uh, called Ant Pizza. Um, and the guy who set it up, um, Michael Lasatoria, ex-advertising, no interest in... Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, little future person. Um, and um, had no experience in the, the um, hospitality, none. And yet said, we're going to create a pizza company and we're going to create um, the best product using the best tools, all, all the equipment, and we're just going to give it a go. And it was in Washington, DC. So he came out and he set up the company. Um, and he said he was terrified. Because he came out into the market day one with the highest labor cost, the highest ingredients cost, and the highest equipment cost. But they had one difference. And that difference was he vowed and committed to a living wage for his staff. Now, all of us, we don't really know about that because in America, people in hospitality live off tips. They don't have what's called a living wage. And he was a real early proponent of that, activist, and said, if I have a company, they're getting a living wage. 
So that was his impact. What happened? Well, six months, struggle, struggle, word got out. There's this cool pizza company that's really good pizzas, but they're paying a living wage. Fuck, we should go there. That's, we, gotta, we wanna support the company that's supporting the staff in our community. So they went. Queues went round the block. They were f stunned. So wonderful, right? Money, you know, great. We're making money and we're having a bit of an impact. How that ripples out is a few years later, government shutdown in Washington. 800,000 government staff were furloughed. And he stood up and he said, if you are working for the government and you're furloughed, you're gonna get free food from us. You just gotta come and we'll give you free pizza. And they were like, whoa, like the investors and the board were like, whoa, whoa, who's modeled this out? What, what, when does it stop? Because it'll work itself out. We set up a company in Washington and they, the community supported us. Now it's our turn. They gave away 30,000 pizzas. And still you go, isn't that amazing? And he's up on Capitol Hill, championing and campaigning for a living wage. And he's out act on like picketing and protests about a living wage. So the impact that we're talking about, we need to define what's most relevant for us. It doesn't need to be climate. There's other things. And if we look at the vast diversity of what's required in the impact space, and we take different slices of that impact across the board, we've got a tsunami of impact. If it's just around climate, we've got a tsunami in that vertical or in that space. There's so much else we can do. So I agree with you that there has to be space for other voices and other interpretations of impact. What I'm talking about though is we need to start with that. We need to build our businesses and our companies and our interaction with companies around what is it that you're doing other than making money? What is it that you're doing that with your revenue and your return, you're reinvesting back into your impact? And if we look at the, I'll finish on this, if we look at the little model ahead, impact equals relevance equals return, the impact that Ant Pizza is having on those individual staff members, the impact that that company is having in the community, and the impact that that company is having in giving back to the community, to the, the level of government, makes them relevant in their lives which makes people interact with them and transact with them to the point of 35 shops in six different markets in the US as a result of an impact model around a living wage. Does that answer your question? Yeah? If not, we can talk about it further out here. <laughs> and you can punch me if you want. <laughs> uh, that, that was a bit of a like, mic drop kind of. No. <laughs> Yeah, you heard it here first, Kevin Finn, on the theme of truth. Um, guys, give Kevin a huge round of applause.